so we, we, we change the scene again, don't we? Uh, we've been with the, the nation of Israel in the future. We've been with the women at the foot of the cross. And now we're going to consider, once again, the, the role of the angels. And yet we know, don't we, that it's all part of one and the, grand, the same grand scheme uh, that the Almighty has with this earth and with mankind upon it. Now, when we consider this word archangels, it's only mentioned twice in Scripture, both times in the, in the New Testament, in Thessalonians and in the Epistle of Jude. But if we go to Daniel chapter 13... Sorry, Daniel chapter 10. Both of those uh, occasions in the, in the New Testament speak of Michael, the archangel. So we ask the question, well, is Michael the only archangel? And really, it's, it's Daniel chapter 10 that answers that question for us. Because in Daniel chapter 10 and at verse 13, we read these words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. Right, so we see two things from that. This word archangel really means a chief angel. And we learn from this verse in Daniel that Michael is one of them. We know that there are three named in scripture, and we'll look at those uh, as we go along. And... There are most likely others as well which are not named. So when we consider archangels, it's, it, it's, it's in the plural really. It's not just Michael, the, the archangel as mentioned in, in Jude and in Thessalonians. So the name Michael means who is like Ale. And when we look at what Michael does, we find that he's the angel that is responsible for the nation of Israel. Because every time he's involved, it, it's the nation of Israel that is, it is the, the subject matter. So, for example, Daniel 10.21. I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that withhold holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. That's the, that's the uh, verse that we've already looked at, or the, cha the chapter that we've already looked at. So, Michael is your prince, the angel says to Daniel, the prince that looks after the nation of Israel. Or another example is in chapter 12 of Daniel, and we'll look at these verses in a bit of detail later on. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. Now, I know some think that that's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I think it's referring to Michael, and we'll see. We'll come back to that um, very shortly. Then there, of course, there is <coughs> these verses in Exodus 23. I'm just putting them on the screen for, for, for brevity, really. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee in the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. For my name is in him. And we sometimes refer to this as the, the name-bearing angel. Possibly Michael once again. Because this name-bearing angel has particular reference once again to the nation of Israel. So, let's go to that verse. We'll, we'll go to Jude, shall we? Uh, and have a look at what Jude has to say about Michael the archangel. It's in verse 9 that we read there uh, of Jude. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Now, that phrase, a railing accusation, actually means a blasphemous judgment. Now, we, we know this is obviously a complicated verse, isn't it? Uh, and we need to go back to uh, the history of this, back in the Old Testament. I'll put the verse on the screen again. This is Zechariah 3. He showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of Yahweh, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. 
So Jude speaks about Michael disputing about the body of Moses, which is the nation of Israel. And here in Zechariah 3, we've got Satan standing at the right hand of the angel to resist him. And then verse 2 of Zechariah 3, The Lord said to Satan, Yahweh rebuked thee, O Satan, even Yahweh that hath chosen re Jerusalem rebuked thee. Now that, that, that reads rather strangely, doesn't it? Yahweh said to Satan, Yahweh rebuked thee. And I think what we're looking at here in Zechariah, where it says, Yahweh said to Satan, that's the angel, the name-bearing angel. As we say, most likely Michael. And what did this angel say? Yahweh rebuked thee, O Satan. Even Yahweh that had chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. Now, if we look at the context in, in Jude, we find that Jude is actually speaking about those adversaries of Israel who speak evil about the things that they do not understand or they don't know. Just look at verse 10 of Jude. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. They speak evil about things of which they are ignorant. And Jude, I think, it is making the contrast between those people and the archangel Michael. He would not bring against them a railing accusation, a blasphemous judgment. He would not say something which is in opposition to Yahweh himself, possibly because he was not aware of all the facts if the context of Jude is anything to go by. Because these are not afraid to speak evil about those things of which they are ignorant. Right, so what, what I'm suggesting here is that in this verse we are being told that, that the angel, Michael, will not bring an accusation, but it, as, the, as though it were, is going to leave it to the Almighty himself. And I suppose there are two things that emerge if that is the case. First of all, that even archangels, even chief angels, don't know everything. Um, and we shall see that elsewhere as well. I suppose the other thing that we can learn from this is not to make judgment to ourselves about things of which we are ignorant. Or maybe when we, when we know half the story and we, we pass a judgment, it's possible to, to do that, isn't it? So there's a lesson there for us. So that's that verse in, in Jude. Let, let's move on, shall we? And go back to Daniel chapter 12. That verse that we've already looked at. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. Now, as I said before, some believe that this is the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus went to his father's right hand and he sat down. And the argument goes, well, now he stands up, he's ready to leave the side of his father. And the other argument is, of course, that angels always stand in the presence of <coughs> Yahweh anyway. I think it's when we look at this phrase, stand up, it's used a lot in Daniel, and it's actually used six times in this final prophecy. And when we look at the way in which it's used, it is actually speaking about people who go to work, as it were. They do things, and they are successful. They stand up in that respect. Let's just briefly look at them on the screen. In Daniel 11 and verse 3, a mighty king shall stand up, and shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. Verse 7. But out of the branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate and shall come with an army and shall prevail. Right? And as, as we go through this prophecy, we see time after time someone or a group of people stand up. But their standing up doesn't last very long because someone else comes along. Uh, verse 14. In those times, there shall many stand up against the king of the south. And we know that with this prophecy, it's all about the king of the north, the king of the south, and Israel in the middle. And here we've got someone who stands up against the king of the south. Or in verse 20, 
then shall stand up in his sight to raise your taxes in the glory of the kingdom. And another one then in verse 21 of Daniel 11. In his estate shall stand up a vile person. He shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. So all the way through this prophecy, Daniel speaks about those who stand up. Those who are successful for a time as it were. But it's not for very long because someone else comes along and they stand up then. But of course when we come to chapter 12 and verse 1. Michael stands up. And there is no one to um, come after that. Michael stands up and he remains in that position. The great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. So that's, that's why I believe that this is actually speaking about Michael. Um, as, the, as the verse says. I suppose the other thing to remember is. When the Lord Jesus Christ reigns. He won't just reign over the nation of Israel. But it will be over all nations. He will be in control of all nations. He will be in control of all angels. And all principalities and powers. As Peter tells us in his first epistle. So that's, that's Michael in these, in these chapters in Daniel. It's at that time. That Michael will stand up. And we say well. What time? What time is Daniel speaking about? Of course, it's the Spirit, isn't it, through Daniel that's speaking about these things. At what time? And once again, if we go back into the prophecy, earlier on, in Daniel 11 at verse 40, we read that. At that time, the king of the south shall push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him. Now, we've, we've believed as a community, haven't we, that this is speaking about Britain. Pushing the Turk out of Palestine. So the king of the south is the power in control of Egypt. It's been that way all the way through the prophecy. The Ptolemies and so on. The king of the north is, is the Seleucids. And eventually of course it will be Gog and his bands. Who will be the king of the north. But Britain pushed the Turk. The him. The one in control of, of Jerusalem. Out of the Middle East. Why right, it was in the First World War wasn't it? So if that is true what we're saying is. The time of the end must have been in existence. At least from that time. From the time of the First World War. That's a mighty long while ago. But we need to remember of course this is. The time scale of the Almighty. And a thousand, a hundred years is neither here nor there. It's just a few moments. In, in that time scale. So. Let's move to another angel that's mentioned here in Isaiah 63. In all their affliction. Speaking about the nation of Israel. He was afflicted. And the angel of his presence. Saved them. We say well, what does that mean? The angel of his presence. It could mean two things. It could mean the angel who dwells in the presence of Yahweh. Even as Gabriel does, he says that. Or it could mean the angel that represents the presence of Yahweh in the earth. Or of course it could be both at the same time. But I feel that the latter of those two is the important one. If we, if we think of what was said about the angel there in Exodus 23. Beware of him. Obey his voice. Provoke him not. He will not pardon your transgressions. For my name is in him. And once again I think both those passages are possibly speaking about the archangel Michael once again. If, if we go back to Isaiah 63. And just look at the context of that passage. Um, Isaiah 63, and we're going to start reading at verse 7. Isaiah 63, verse 7. I will mention the loving kindness of Yahweh and the praises of Yahweh according to all that Yahweh hath bestowed on us. 
and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he hath bestowed on them according to his mercies, and according to the multitude of his loving kindness. For he said, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their saviour. That's when they believed in him, he was their saviour. And then verse 9, In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. Now this is quite interesting, because we read in verse 9, and we've looked at that passage already, the angel of his presence saved them. And then we read in the following verse that they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. I think we've been told here that the angel of his presence and the Holy Spirit is one and the same. It's an angel that's being mentioned here when the Holy Spirit is mentioned in verse 10. It's worth mentioning actually that it's not possible to cause grief or to, or to vex a power if it's just the power of the Holy Spirit that's being mentioned here. I think it's the angel that's being mentioned. So, verse 11 there. He remembered the days of old. Moses and his people saying, Where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? Uh, and the way the authorised version reads, that suggests that it's speaking about the Holy Spirit being within Moses, which of course it was. But I don't think what, that is what this verse is saying. When we, when we look at a number of other versions, RV and our ESV, for example, where is he who put in the midst of them his Holy Spirit? Or again, the New King James, where is he who put his Holy Spirit within them? And this is obviously speak, speaking about the nation, like the Holy Spirit was within the nation, or Young's Literal, putting in its midst his Holy Spirit. And I think, once again, it's a reference to the angel, once again. You might disagree with that. But let's just go on to the next verse. That led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name. And we say, what well, does that glorious arm refer to Moses? Or is it the angel? Once again, different versions help. There's RV and ESV that caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses that divided the water before them to make himself an everlasting name. His glorious arm went at the right hand of Moses. So it was almost as though when Moses stretched out his hand with his rod over the sea, the angel was there beside him. And it was the angel that parted the waters. It wasn't Moses that parted the waters. We, we know that from the record in Exodus, which we looked at on Monday. The angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood before them. And then we read later on, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and Yahweh caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night. Once again, I believe it was the angel that, that did that. So, let's move on again. We've looked at Genesis 18 already. I want to go back there, uh, just briefly. That was the occasion when the three men came to Abram, as he was sitting in the tent door, and they were, of course, not just men, but they were angels. What I'm suggesting is, can we identify who these three angels were? I think possibly we can. When we find out 
what their mission was. First of all, they come in chapter 18, uh, if we look at verse 9, for example, to inform Abraham uh, of what was to happen. Verse 9, they said to him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. We note the change here. They said, and then in verse 10, And he said, I think this was the lead angel, if you like, possibly Michael once again. He said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah, thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, and, and we know what uh, proceeded from, from, from that particular incident. So that's one reason that these three angels had come, to let Abram know about the birth of his son in his old age. They'd also come, of course, to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 19, uh, sorry, chapter 19, and at verse 24, where we read, And Yahweh rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from Yahweh out of heaven, and overthrew those cities, and all the plain, and all the inhabitants of the cities. So they come to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. They told Abram that. But there was something else that they had to do. And that was to rescue Lot first. Uh, chapter 19 and verse 22. The angel says to Lot, Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou be come thither. So they were the three reasons that these three angels had appeared at this time. And we say, well, it's quite likely that the lead angel was Michael, the angel responsible for Israel, the one who speaks as when it says, and Yahweh said, this was, this was Michael speaking. They'd also come to destroy Sodom. And the suggestion is that the angel who was to oversee the destruction of Sodom was one of these three. Possibly having a whole team of angels working with him. It's almost as though that they had three uh, missions to accomplish. And therefore there were three angels there. And that's why, uh, because, because of the things they had to do. And the third one, of course, would be the angel who camped around, and camped around Lot, as we saw from Psalm 34 earlier, <laughs> earlier in the week. I think it helps us to understand when we, we try and look at things like this to see how the angels work. It's not as though the Almighty just snaps his fingers and, and something happens. It's always angels that put his will into practice. And as we've said before, there are millions of them. And whatever the Lord wants to do, he will have an angel there, or a group of angels maybe, to, to, to put that into practice. Well, there's another angel that's actually named uh, back in Daniel. Let's go back to Daniel again, shall we? Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8 and at verse 13. Daniel actually overhears, as it were, a conversation between two angels. He says there, verse 13, And I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said to that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice? But right, so we see from this to begin with that one angel didn't know the answer to this question and he was asking another angel. So once again, not all angels know everything. I suppose if we put all the angelic hosts together, right, then they know everything collectively. But because they've got different roles, they don't all know everything. Right, so in verse 13 there, that certain saint, if we look at the margin, it tells us there it's the wonderful number or Hebrew Palmoni. So, Palmoni seems to be responsible for making sure that things happen at the right time. 
And when you think about it, that's an immensely important job. When we consider the thousands of things that are happening in the world every moment, all under the control of, of Yahweh, and things have got to happen at the right time. And Palmoni is the one who is in charge of all that. So he had to reveal to this other angel how long it was going to be, and we don't have time to look at all the details there of that particular time period. Mm -hmm. So time periods, Palmoni must be involved, and lots of other things as well. And the suggestion is that the outworking of all these things are controlled by Palmoni, and furthermore, other angels have to consult with him. And we see the interaction between angels now, don't we? You know, Palmoni makes sure that he's not involved in what has got to happen, but make sure that it happens at the right time, is the wonderful number who does that. And we get that little insight there in Daniel chapter 8 of one angel consulting Palmoni about a particular time period. And once again, we're suggesting there that Palmoni most likely does not work alone. But there's a whole team of angels working with him, maybe working under him to make sure that things do happen at the right time. The other angel who is named in scripture is, of course, Gabriel, the mighty El. And when we consider the work of Gabriel, we reach the conclusion quite clearly that Gabriel is the angel responsible for the Lord Jesus Christ. And once again, what a responsibility. An angel assigned to the Lord Jesus Christ in his crucial role of reconciliation between Yahweh and those who will put their trust in him. And Gabriel has been involved right from day one in that particular mission and right through to the end, and he's still involved as well. So, there's that crucial role that we mentioned. Uh, well, we're in Daniel, Daniel chapter 8, and at verse 15. Daniel is trying to find out what the meaning of a particular vision had been. And he says, It came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning... Then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. We say, well, why was it that Gabriel was the, the, the one chosen to make Daniel understand this particular vision? I think the answer is, when we look at what the vision was all about, it involved the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 25. And through his policy also shall he cause craft to prosper in his hand. He shall magnify himself in his heart. And by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. But he shall be broken without hand. And there's another vision in Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, where Gabriel is called in once again to make Daniel understand. Daniel chapter 9 and at verse 21. Daniel says, Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And we've looked briefly at this already, haven't we? It was Daniel that was, sorry, it was Gabriel that was the one who <coughs> made Daniel understand that particular vision. And once again, this is all about the Lord Jesus Christ and his work of reconciliation, as we see from verse, verses 24 and 25. Verse 25 actually mentions Messiah the Prince there. So even before Messiah was born, Gabriel was involved in Helping Daniel, first of all, to understand these things. And then if we move on 450 years, we come into Luke chapter 1. So if we look now at Luke chapter 1 and at verse 26. 
words that we know well. It's the angel Gabriel once again that's involved here. So Luke chapter 1 and verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin as passed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin name, virgin name was Mary. And Gabriel here had come to announce to Mary before Jesus was born as to what was to happen and how that the birth of her child would be none other than the birth of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who will be great and be called the Son of the Highest, and so on and so on. But once again, specifically, it was Gabriel that announced this to Mary. Now, it's interesting in Scripture that sometimes we're told something like that, but we're not told it the next time or the next time. We have to sort things out for ourselves. I think we've got a similar situation here because there are other occasions when Gabriel must be in action. How about that verse? It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. All the world had to be moved so that one woman could be in the right place at the right time. Possibly Palmoni involved in this as well. So that the prophecy in Micah that I suspect we'll be looking at tomorrow with, uh, with, with Brother uh, Simon, we should be looking at that prophecy then. They are Bethlehem of Frater. So Mary had to be in Bethlehem. And it's amazing, isn't it? The whole world was moved. How many angels were involved in that? And we can only surmise, can't we? And then at Luke chapter 2 and verse 8. In the same country there were shepherds, and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. Most likely Gabriel once again. To announce now to the shepherds of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in Matthew chapter 2. When they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, possibly Gabriel involved here once again, to make sure that the Son of God was not destroyed by Herod and, and his men. And now we've got Gabriel in action at Messiah's ministry. This indeed was a unique role. The Lord Jesus Christ was unique. He never sinned. You see, the angels which encamp around us have to cope with the fact that, that we are sinners. But that didn't apply to the Lord Jesus Christ. But nevertheless, there were times when he needed help. And he needed help sorely. Just go back to Isaiah chapter 50. And here's a suggest suggestion once again in Isaiah 50 that we've got possibly the work of the angel here helping the Lord Jesus Christ Isaiah chapter 50 we know that this is a passage which speaks about the Lord Jesus Christ if we look for example at verse 6 I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair I hid not my face from shame and spitting Obviously speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if we just go back to verse 4. The Lord Yahweh hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He waketh mine ear to hear of the learned. Now is that a reference to the angel once again speaking morning by morning? To the Lord Jesus Christ. Possibly. But we know that there were specific times during the ministry. That the angel was present. You know at the baptism for example. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. There was a voice from heaven. 
most likely the voice of the Archangel uh, Gabriel once again. And then Gabriel's final encouragement, we've called it here, when he was in the garden, there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And this really was when the, the final decision was made, wasn't it? Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. But he, he decided from now on he was going to come on with it. But the angel of the Lord was there with him, strengthening him to make sure that he did make the right decision here. Don't know exactly what the angel said to him. We, we can surmise, I suppose, but it's probably not, not wise to do that. So we call that Gabriel's final encouragement. And then we've got Gabriel in action, even at Messiah's death. Brother Neil has mentioned this already. Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Not, not human action, because that would have been from the bottom to the top, wouldn't it? And then we've got the earth quaking. And then we've got the graves being opened. How many angels are involved in this? Quite a few. At the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and his death. Well, and death then resurrection so we move to his resurrection and it's the angels once again which are there uh, I think Brother Neil briefly mentioned uh, Matthew 28 but he didn't go to it let's, let's have a quick look shall we we have been there before this week in Matthew 28 at the resurrection morning so we read there at, uh, verse 1 in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn, toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake once again. Why? For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. And his countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow for fear of him the keepers did shake and become as dead men. And as, as Brother Neil has shown us, there were a number of angels involved at this particular time as well, uh, at the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the important thing to remember is, all these angels work together as one. It's not as though that they've all got their own agendas. They've got one agenda, and uh, that is, of course, governed by Yahweh himself. That passage there, which we've looked at already, shows us that the first angel who was speaking to Daniel here in verse 12 needed help from the archangel Michael. The passage is suggesting that the prince of uh, Persia was how could we put it, giving the angel a hard time, making it difficult for the angel to, to accomplish what it wanted. And so he needed more help, and that's why he went to Michael, one of the chief princes, so that the mission might be accomplished. And we see, don't we, how that the angels work one with another. We looked at that uh, passage from Brother Thomas from Eureka. They work together as one. And it's an exhortation for us, isn't it, that we too should work together as one in our ecclesias. Sadly, it doesn't always happen. But with the angels, it does always happen. So just in conclusion, in summary, we say that the angels are numberless. I mentioned that passage before, but let's go to it this time. Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5 and... Verse 11. This is one of those glorious visions around the throne in the kingdom age. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the living ones and the elders. And the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands. And each one of those angels 
is occupied in doing the will of Yahweh. We say, well, what are they all doing? It's when we consider the vastness of, of, of the work involved. All over the world these angels are doing their own particular job so that the will of the Heavenly Father is done. And as we've said before, the Lord could just snap his fingers and, uh, and wave his magic wand as it were and things might happen. But he doesn't work that way. And he won't work that way in the future either. And we shall be looking at that on, on Friday. So we say the angels are numberless. They operate in this hierarchical structure. There are angels and there are archangels. And we'll say more about that on Friday as well. They work together as one. And each angel has a, a specific role. And finally, there's no rancour with the angels. It's not like men, is it? Korah, Dathan and Abiram, for example, didn't like the job that they were allotted. They wanted Moses' job. And so they caused a whole lot of trouble trying to do that. But that's not so with the angels. And so we're exhorted, aren't we, to strive to be like the angels now in these respects so that indeed we might be like them when the Lord appears. So what we want to do tomorrow is to consider how the angels have been at work from the first century up until the present and even beyond, which is quite an interesting study in itself. Thank you.